Um, uh, in this presentation, the, the main topic of my presentation is essentially an analysis and a discussion of all the main uh, issues, all the main problems that we have that are involved in the statistical treatment of the forecasting of solar progeny events, especially through machine learning approaches. Um, this is a brief outline of the presentation. I will uh, uh, spend a few words about solar proton events and uh, in the framework, in the general framework of space weather forecasting. And uh, then I will move to uh, a specific model for the solar proton event forecasting that is the experta model in this case. And uh, I, will I will explain the model and investigate all the problems that are related with the model and with, uh, uh, in general, uh, this kind of uh, dealing with this kind of data. And uh, I will go through the model calibration and also the model validation. So um, as an uh, introduction, I'd like to um, define, the, to report here, an earliest definition of the space weather that is essentially uh, the um, set of conditions of the sun and the solar wind, magnetosphere, ionosphere, and thermosphere that can influence human activity, basically, and human health. So um, in, this in this case, uh, we know that solar energetic particles are really important because they're really hazardous for uh, both uh, uh, human activity and human health. And uh, solar energetic particles, just a few words, as uh, Charlotte just mentioned them, and as everybody knows, are essentially um, composed by uh, mo mainly protons and electrons and uh, in a minority part by EV rides. And they are sporadically emitted at the sun and uh, associated with uh, uh, transient phenomena such as uh, uh, big solar flares and uh, uh, coronal mass ejections. They are detectable as sudden increases in, uh, for instance, the proton flux as uh, called uh, also solar proton events. And uh, they are detectable in space and uh, also sometime at the earth when we deal with rel rel relativistic proton energies, such in the case of ground level enhancement. Um, regarding the, uh, the effect, uh, essentially, of these uh, uh, solar proton events on uh, human activities, uh, I reported here uh, just a few examples. They uh, can induce, for instance, damages to spacecraft operation and electronics. They uh, can uh, uh, effect also uh, affect radio communication radar systems through the ionization of the atmosphere and also be hazardous for the human health uh, if we think about astronauts uh, operations on the international space station and also uh, pilots of uh, airlines uh, especially during uh, GLE uh, events so um, for all of these reasons, it's really important to have a good model, a robust model uh, in making prediction of this kind of event. And we have uh, many models that uh, are, have been developed during the last decades to do that. And uh, they can be divided essentially into these uh, three uh, classes. We have physics-based models that are computationally expensive uh, in general because they uh, lie, relies essentially on the physics of the solar energetic particles. So we are putting the physics in this model and uh, this limit essentially the ability of this kind of model to produce a real, real, uh, real time alert. On the other end, uh, uh, the empirical models and also the machine learning models that let's say can be considered a, a special class of empirical models um, that does not deal, do not deal with uh, essentially the physics of the acceleration of particles, but just uh, are uh, model meant for uh, finding correlation associations between some input variables, some proxies like uh, solar flares characteristics, uh, coronal mass ejection characteristics, and uh, find an association with the uh, occurrence of solar energetic particle events. So these models are typically uh, uh, give a rapid forecast and uh, for this can be easily incorporated into uh, an operational framework of space weather. I mean, the machine learning models are rely especially on machine learning sophisticated technique and, uh, and we, we can say the same thing of the empirical models for them. So all of these models uh, have to be constrained of course to the sun to air our transit time of the protons that in the range between 10 MeV and 20 GeV is uh, about 15 minutes up to a uh, few hours. 
So just to have a look of uh, how many models have been produced by the scientific community during the last years, I reported here this table that classifies uh, into the three classes all these uh, solar problem uh, events uh, models. And uh, just to um, compare some performances uh, from this model that you find here, the uh, uh, probability of de detection, uh, validation measure, and the false alarm rate that are quantifying essentially the um, goodness of our model in a predictive, the positive event, uh, and uh, how uh, many false alarms uh, our model is, uh, is claiming uh, for a given input. So uh, these are some models I reported here, uh, for instance, the POD and the FAR for uh, all of them. And we can see that, for instance, if we look at this uh, force path, CME data and uh, UMASEP, uh, we can see that these models uh, uh, on difference with respect to the other include, for instance, the CME parameters as a input feature to make a prediction, we can see that the probability of detection increases in this case, but uh, it's not the same for the uh, false alarm rate that is not so, so much reduced. This is due to the fact that uh, there are many uh, fast traveling CMEs that are not associated uh, with an SCP. So, uh, moreover, the uh, CME observation are not uh, available in uh, real time. So another important uh, quantity that we have to take into account when uh, validating the model is the warning time. And I report here a nice uh, picture uh, of a, a solar energetic particle event observed on January 2016. And these vertical lines right here uh, are essentially all the warning times associated with the, all uh, of each of these models uh, for uh, evaluated on this event. So we can see that the ML soil LASCO models that uh, rely essentially on coronal mass ejection precursors have a nice warning time. The last one to give the alert before the onset of the event is the UMASEP model that includes as an input feature also the uh, proton flux itself. In this case, the Esperta model uh, was uh, quite delayed with respect to its uh, average warning time that is of more or less four hours. And this is due essentially to, the, uh, to this uh, uh, smooth rising phase of this uh, particular flare. So coming to a uh, more specific, uh, uh, let, let me focus on the empirical model for solar proton event real-time alert, uh, let's say Esperta. And uh, this model is essentially a model meant uh, to classify and predict uh, solar energetic particles uh, in terms of binary classification, so occurrence or non-occurrence of the event, and uh, by um, essentially using uh, as a precursors only the uh, flares characteristic, the characteristics of the flares of class greater than M2. So uh, the data set that we use in the validation of this model consists essentially in uh, uh, all the flares uh, observed um, greater than M2 observed in this period of time, so between 1955 and 1995 and 2017. And in this same interval, we have uh, a 92 number of SEPs event and uh, a total number of flares that is 934. So from these two numbers, we can uh, just uh, fix some points of the, our discussion. So uh, we are dealing with uh, uh, a poor statistics and uh, we are dealing with imbalancing between uh, SCP events and non-SCP events associated with flares. So the input parameters of the SPERTA model are the flare longitude, the soft X-ray fluence, and the radio uh, wave uh, fluence. And uh, I reported here the histograms divided by the classes, so associated to SP events and non-associated to SCP events. And we can see that uh, the red lines that represent essentially the percentage histogram of the flare associated to SME to SCP are essentially uh, shows in longitude this uh, very well known asymmetry due to the fact that, uh, as Charlotte said before, uh, the Earth is well connected with the central meridian and western part of the uh, southern hemispheric um, equatorial region. So uh, also solar X-ray fluence and uh, radio waves are uh, essentially good 
parameters in separating the two classes, the non-SCP and the SCP associated events, but uh, all this uh, overlap region between uh, all the distribution that you are looking in this picture represent essentially a source of error for our uh, predictive model and uh, those, uh, thus they are uncertainty for the model. So if we look at this, uh, sorry, Okay, if we look at this distribution and we evaluate the cumulative distribution function for both the SCP, uh, SCP associated event and no SCP associated event, what we get is that uh, for the SCP associated event, we uh, observe a clear break here in correspondence of this value of the longitude, the, the, essentially uh, associated with the fact that we are not well connected, well connected from a magnetical point of view uh, along the Parker spiral with the eastern part of the uh, of the sun. And um, this uh, allows us also to make a filter of the data. We can uh, disregard these near flares uh, in a, an operational point, from an operational point of view, uh, in order to make predictions for SCP events that are more uh, important and more intense. Um, on the other end, if we look at the trend of the cumulative distribution function associated to the uh, non-SCP uh, uh, events, we can see that there is clearly an independence on the longitude, so uh, it is uniform. So uh, Esperta, uh, um, from the machine learning perspe perspective, is considered a supervised learning approach, and uh, we can uh, indeed, in this uh, framework, define the so-called feature input vector that is a vector containing all the features, so all the uh, parameters associated to the uh, flare, solar flares. And we, we define T as a target ve vector, a target variable. This target variable uh, should be in this case, uh, is uh, defined as a binary classification. So uh, it uh, could be one if, uh, it is one if the uh, X uh, feature is associated with an SCP and is it zero if um, otherwise. So we can define a function f that uh, relates essentially the x features to the target uh, variable uh, through these weights that are still unknown at this point. And uh, uh, this is essentially the, uh, th this uh, um, allows us to um, train in the model because uh, by optimizing an error function, we can find essentially the optimum weights that allows to generalize uh, the prediction to unseen data. So we use in general uh, in the training phase uh, a vector T of known events uh, and uh, try to generalize uh, the optimized weights uh, to uh, make new predictions. So the experta model exploits the logistic probability. So it's a, a probability approach in the sense that there is a probability function that is defined is associated with uh, each event and the optimization is performed with respect to the to the lot likelihood function and the output of this logistic probability is mapped into a binary class so we claim an SCP event if the probability associated to the uh, feature x with i uh, for instance exceed the values 0.5 or uh, vice versa so um, the main problem uh, associated with the statistical treatment of this kind of data are uh, essentially the overlapping, as I said before, of the SCP events and no SCP events in the parameter space. So this means that essentially uh, looking at the parameter space, we have um, the classes that are not very well separated uh, by, by the parameters. And this is due essentially to the, uh, for instance, the presence of hidden variable that we are not considering or the synergies between uh, the feature uh, in, uh, in the model. So uh, this uh, framework, uh, this, uh, in this framework, this represent, this can induce a bias in our estimation. So in order to take into account this bias, we have uh, uh, to set a threshold right here, a decision threshold, and we have to optimize in the calibration of the model, this decision threshold on the given data set that we are uh, studying. Um, another problem is represented by the imbalance data set, since we have uh, uh, a ratio between the SCP associated events and no SCP associated events that is uh, uh, 0.1. Um, 
about 0.1. And in this case, if we look at the loss function that can, can be divided into L1 and uh, L0, where L1 is the loss function associated to the uh, class of SAP event, uh, L0 is the uh, loss function associated, the part of the loss function associated with the class of the known SAP events. So we can essentially, we have two ways to balance the classes in the uh, validation of the model. And these two ways are, the first one is the straightforward weighting of the loss function. That means that we are multiplying these two terms by the inverse frequency of the occurrence of the, uh, the, the respective class. And the other, uh, the other uh, things that we can do is essentially the oversampling. Where sampling mean take the um, minority class and just uh, create, generate synthetic data in order to augment the statistics of this class and to balance the, the whole data set. So um, after that, we have to validate our model. And uh, I define here, th these are the two metrics uh, for the validation that I defined at the beginning. So the probability of detection and the false alarm rate. And these are optimized in this framework. Uh, these are optimized by um, finding the best trade-off through the uh, so-called critical success index that is defined like this. And essentially, is uh, the index is the score associated to the model that uh, maximizes the probability of detection and minimizes the false alarm rate simultaneously. And the validation of the model is uh, done in the framework of stratified validation stratified cross-validation. That means that essentially we are dividing our set, our data set in uh, different folds and uh, we are considering all the parts of the, of the data set uh, as a, train, a training test, a training set and as a test set. As you can see here, all the points of the data set are used uh, to do this. So this allows us to uh, give uh, unbiased estimation that does not depend on the um, particular choice of the testing or training uh, data set. In this case, it is important to note that in this uh, scam, essentially I'm reporting, you have to think about this um, horizontal bars as uh, the um, um, sorted data. And uh, you can think that uh, uh, if we uh, take the ratio between the length of these segments, uh, for instance, in red, that represent the percentage associated to the test set, or in blue, that uh, represent the percentage of data associated for, uh, to the training set, uh, the ratio between the two classes of, this, of these uh, four sets is essentially the same. This is really important in the model calibration. So uh, why this is important? Because if we study, if we perform a parametric study of these metrics, like the probability of detection and the false alarm rate, we can see uh, this uh, behavior, this different behavior. So in this picture, I report this figure, we have the number of flares in the train set on the x-axis and the number of SCP events on the training set on the y-axis. What we get is that if uh, we change this number, so if we change essentially the percentage of SCP events that we are including in our test set, the probability of detection is almost unaffected. So we can see that the value is quite uh, stable for all the values of the parameters. On the other end, if we study the uh, false alarm rate, uh, what we can see is essentially that there is a strong dependence on uh, the values on the fraction of the SCP events that are considered in the test set. And uh, we can, uh, by defining tau as uh, the occurrence of the SEP in the, the SCP events in the uh, test set, we can essentially extrapolate this uh, uh, linear relation that uh, for a fixed tau, fixed values of tau associate a different values of the false alarm rate score uh, of the same model. So this means that we uh, actually have to choose a value of tau that uh, in our case is close to 0 0.1 and uh, it must be uh, calibrated with the expected occurrence for the event, for the class of, of event that we want to predict. Okay, this is just an example. Uh, from a probabilistic point of view, if we write uh, in terms of condition probability, the probability of detection and the false alarm rate of the model, what we can, uh, what we get is essentially that the probability, the probability of detection can be considered as a uh, simple prior probability, uh, whereas uh, the false alarm rate, uh, after some math by applying uh, 
the bias theorem can be written in this form. So this means essentially that uh, uh, we can see here clearly that uh, this uh, uh, explicit dependence on the ratio of the uh, occurrence of SCP events in the test set, so in, in our data set. So the first important result of this analysis is that the model needs to be calibrated with respect to the occurrence of the solar proton events. Um, during the model calibration, uh, in, in order to do the, the validation of the model, we have uh, uh, to fix this tau that in our case uh, is essentially 92 uh, over uh, 934. So is the ratio of SCP event with respect to the total number of flares included in uh, the data set. And uh, for each value of the threshold, uh, we compute the validation matrix. So uh, in this case, we are essentially, uh, very, uh, we, we vary essentially the uh, decision threshold epsilon that I introduced uh, in order to, uh, uh, that, that I introduced you before. And the optimal threshold minimizes the uh, critical success index. Uh, this means that we are uh, essentially uh, choosing the best trade-off between uh, probability of detection and false alarm rate. So you can see an important result from this analysis is that the uh, parameters, the, the uh, metrics of the validation for this model uh, strongly depends on the value of the de decision threshold. So we can see that there is a huge uh, variation of, this, of the values of the score as a function of epsilon. So in this case, uh, this, the, uh, I, I reported here with these vertical lines, essentially for uh, the three cases of uh, es basic experta, let's say. The experta with the uh, weighting of the loss function and the experta with the oversampling of the minority class are reported here, the, uh, uh, the lines corresponding to the point of the maximum of the critical success index score. By looking at, and by looking at numbers, uh, we can see that uh, uh, in this table, there is a comparison between the basic uh, experta model, the experta model with weighted loss function and with uh, oversampling. And we can see that the um, performance of the model in, term of, in terms of uh, probability of detection and false alarm rate is not uh, changing so much. And uh, the same can be uh, seen also for, uh, um, by filtering the data. Uh, so by disregarding the Eastern uh, events, the Eastern flare events. And in this case, so we can see uh, it's exactly the same thing. We have an improvement of the uh, performance of the model by filtering the data. But uh, when we deal with unbalanced data, we do uh, some weighting of the loss function or uh, oversampling, we cannot see uh, so much uh, improvement in, uh, in the performance. So this means that uh, uh, as a third result, I'd like to say that techniques for handling imbalanced problems do not get much better performance. This means, uh, in conclusion, that uh, this kind of uh, pre prediction based on solar fl flare Ricard sorts uh, essentially suffer from systematic error, let's say. So the phase space is not totally divided by the features that we are using as input, and uh, may be uh, due to the fact that there are hidden variables or synergies that are not catch also for the low statistics of the problem uh, by the machine learning approach. And um, we know that increased performance for a uh, longitude that are associated with flares of central meridian or uh, the western part that are they were connected with Earth are also the most hazardous. So in an operational framework, uh, it makes sense to disregard the eastern part, eastern part of the flares, because these are the, mo the most hazardous, having the fastest solar proton event onset, rise time, and uh, peak intensity. So. Um, I leave here my conclusions and I like to thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much for these uh, highlight insights into a real topic thank of you. the forecasting. Uh, we have time for questions. Yes, Robbie. Thank you. Uh, an easy question, probably, and a very complicated one. The easy one is, uh, do you see any differences in um, solar cycles, in the success rates for positive or negative solar cycles? Okay, so um, in this case, uh, um, 
we actually didn't divide the class of event in uh, uh, solar cycle in different parts of the solar cycle, but uh, all this kind of information in uh, some sense are uh, uh, present because we are just we are considering uh, all the solar flares uh, of a class uh, greater than M2. So uh, the information of the solar cycle, uh, active, the solar activity is essentially contained in the occurrence of flares in some sense. So this kind of information are present in the model, but uh, we didn't do that because uh, we want to um, find uh, a power, uh, um, let's say, an effective and robust statistical way to uh, treat with, uh, with predictions. It's not physically based. It's just interesting to see if the predictions are of equal quality. Yeah. Like yeah. Um, the more complicated question is this. Uh, machine learning is computationally very expensive, at least quite often. Mm -hmm. um, so my question has always been, why does one not use physics in machine learning algorithms? We know <laughs> physics works. We know the physics. And that's a fact. Okay, so why do we let a super machine try to learn physics on its own? Why don't we but physical models are expensive if machine learning models are also expensive from a computational point of view to bring them together I mean, could be a little problem no in this case I'd, I'd like to answer like this. in this case we are uh, not dealing with the expensive machine learning uh, computations so this is just a classificator so we are dealing with uh, a few uh, data points in terms of uh, hundreds, and uh, this allows us to have a quick prediction and instantaneous prediction by uh, knowing the flares' uh, characteristics. So, in this sense, uh, these kind of models are not uh, expensive from a computational point of view. Mm. I, I think there are, there is work going on into that direction, especially in uh, yeah, putting in the modeling of the evolution of the magnetic topology on the sun and then yeah. going Let on. Let me start including yes. some physics. Yes. In this kind of uh, one last question. You mentioned the three approaches. Mm -hmm. And uh, from the concept, is the machine learning approach uh, better suited for short time warning times or is there? You mentioned up to two hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It depends uh, essentially on the event because oh. uh, because yeah. you are constrained uh, essentially to the uh, physics of the of the events that you are looking. If you see this light, uh, reported here, for yeah. instance, this constraint that is essentially uh, general for all the model, both physics based, mm -hmm. empirical, and machine learning. So, yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, more questions? Doesn't seem the case. Also, remote, we have no questions. So let's thank Simone once again. Thank you.